G'day crypto goers, I'm Adam Stokes. Welcome back to the channel where it is an absolutely scorching day down under. But we have a question from our crypto brother or perhaps sister PK that reads, Adam, which cryptos will allow complete anonymity in your opinion from the prying eyes of both the Australian government and international governments and agencies? And how do we view the fact that the take up of crypto in Australia is at present abysmal in terms of the actual number of businesses that transact with various Bitcoin. Where can we find a current list of Australia-wide businesses that do transact with cryptos? Thanks, enjoy your show. Uh, PK, it's a great question. I was going to write back to you in the comments, but because the question is so good and so important, I'm dedicating this video to you. Congratulations. Okay, so in the first instance, you asked about which are the best uh, coins that offer the best anim anonymity, which is a fun word to say, with or without braces. But the, to answer your question, the, there are several, but the best one would probably be Monero. So the, the one that we speak about the most is probably Monero and Zcash. Uh, Mimblewimble's getting out there. There are others that are out there, but let's look at Monero as the first example of the best privacy coin. So they offer complete privacy in the sense that they can't be traced or tracked. So many people criticize Bitcoin uh, on the outside saying that Bitcoin allows for the black market transactions. That in fact is completely untrue. Uh, Bitcoin is more traceable than cash and there are other coins such as Monero that do allow for this black economy. But I don't think it's actually fair to say it's all about a black economy. Privacy doesn't mean you're doing something illegal. And I've given the example before of when you shower or go to the toilet or attend a hospital room in privacy, that doesn't make you a criminal, even though your body is the same as pretty much everyone else's around you. Privacy is a right. It's part of a free and democratic process where you have the right to privacy. So a privacy coin does not necessarily mean that you're doing something wrong. And the issue that we do face with privacy coins, however, is that if a government was going to attack a coin, it would actually be something like Monero or a privacy coin before it was something like Bitcoin. And the reason is, I recently did a video on uh, tax on cryptos in Australia. And part of the reason why the Australian government has allowed cryptos to go ahead to date is because they can get tax on it. So cryptos are a great form of generating tax revenue for the Australian Taxation Office. And I can speak firsthand on this and the amount of tax I've paid on the crypto profits that I've made, doing the right thing, declaring it, not trying to be um, sneaky and go behind the ATO's bank uh, back. It is a asset and a commodity and in some ways a stock that you can buy low, sell high and claim those profits as you should with everything that you do within an economy. If you're doing the right thing, you claim or you put forward the profits that you've made and then you pay taxes on those profits. And for that reason, the ATO kind of likes it, in my opinion. When it comes to something like Monero though, you could still claim any profits that you made on it. But remember, these coins aren't designed necessarily to buy low and sell high, although that seems to be what's happening at the moment, particularly with Bitcoin. Not many people are spending these coins. That's not actually the overall intent of crypto. The intent of crypto is to use it as money, that is to trade every day. So if when it comes to, we see these massive crackdowns on cash at the moment, cash ban, negative interest rates, and all the other absurdity with, around quantitative easing, um, bail-in laws, and so forth, all of these things are an attack on your cash. And if Bitcoin were to move forward, they could still in some ways attack it either by banning it, in theory, or taxing it, which is fine. But when it comes to privacy coins, they can't actually see it. So I had an interview with the Crypto Lark some time ago, and I, I spoke about the spectrum of cryptocurrencies. At one end, you've got something that's very transparent, and at the other end, you've got something that's completely private. And I spoke about what the governments would go after if they were going to attack something. And we both agreed that Monero would probably be a coin that the government would go after to try and close down if they were going to take a full on attack on cryptocurrencies. And the reason why they would do that is because of the black economy being able to 
trade value without it being visible to anyone, but it would also be because of tax evasion, which is arguably part of the black economy as well. So the danger with, in my opinion, and I own some Monero, um, but the danger with these coins, and I own Zcash as well, the danger with these things is if, if crypto is going to come under attack, in my opinion, the first thing that they'll be attacking is privacy coins for those reason, reasons of privacy and tax evasion. Which moves on to the next question that you asked about why is there such a slow take up of cryptocurrencies, namely Bitcoin, in Australia? Well, this is a really good question. And I refer to what the Godfather shows us, that being Andreas Antonopoulos in the crypto space. Part of the reason why it's been slow to take up is, first of all, it's a new technology. So when the internet was invented and email was created as an application on the internet, on the internet it, it wasn't taken up immediately. You had to build the infrastructure and people had to start adopting this technology. And when email first came out, and I'll digress a little bit here, remember Bitcoin is an application on the blockchain. The technology isn't necessarily Bitcoin, the technology is the blockchain. Just as the technology on the internet is not email, email is merely an application on the internet, but when the internet came out, email was kind of the first thing we knew. And then the second thing we knew was um, the World Wide Web through the sense of that you could do searches for anything you wanted. And it wasn't until Google made a centralized search engine that was very good. There were other search engines out there, but it wasn't until then that the internet really took off. Originally, when you wanted to write an email on the internet, you had to write all these lines of code, essentially to make an address so you could send it to someone. And then as the technology evolved and we had more standardized approaches, you can just join Hotmail or Gmail or Yahoo or all of these providers and very easily send an email now from your phone. Before it had to, had to be from a computer, now you can do it from your phone. And that's because these things have evolved. And the same thing happened with building websites. If you recall many years ago when you wanted to build a website, you had to go through a company and get them to build it for you. Or you had to learn how to code and go through all these troubles of coding up a website. Well now, making a website is something that you can do on a tablet or even on your phone. It would be difficult, it would be clunky, but you could still do it whilst you're watching TV. And that's because these processes have become much simpler. So over time, internet has become very easy to use and adopted by the masses. Now we've got internet 2.0, and internet 2.0 is, in my opinion, the blockchain this ability to decentralize all this information on a completely transparent ledger, unless it's a privacy coin, and everyone can transact on this ledger safer, faster, and cheaper than standard ledgers that we use today. And this is part of the evolution of technology. Same when cars came out, they weren't adopted straight away. Even when electricity came out, they were just gonna use it at the Paris Fair, then take it off the market and never use it again. Pretty much every technology that comes up, there is a certain period of time where people have to adopt this technology. And when this technology involves the transaction of information, in this instance, money, you, you need someone to receive it at the other end. So for example, if I've got email and you don't, it doesn't matter how good my email is, it doesn't matter how good the website is, if I can't send it to you because you don't adopt it, it, nothing really happens. All that really happened when email first came out was you had a, a group of geeks sending emails to each other. But now, of course, email is just a standard practice. So how does this translate to, to Australia? Well, as the Godfather was saying, essentially in first world countries, because our fiat systems on the surface seem to be stable, many think that we don't actually need to use crypto. Because at the moment, you can just walk into a shop, tap with your money, uh, tap with your card and use money to transact. But that's not the real power of crypto at the moment for first world countries and even second and third world countries. The real power of crypto is the stability. That is, quantitative easing is pouring so much money into economies that it is, def or through inflation, it's devaluing your money. So the more money we pour into an economy, the more it dilutes your money, the less valuable it becomes. And this is amplified in countries such as Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Greece, and all these nations that have huge quantitative easing uh, methods going through their economy that is in fact destroying their economy. And it's destroying their economy because people can't save money 
and they can't save money because what they put in the bank in the morning is worth half as much as it is in the afternoon. So in Australia, America, England and other first world countries, we say, why do we need Bitcoin? Why do we need Bitcoin? Because I can go down to the shop right now and just tap and pay. And although I experience inflation, I kind of can predict that that inflation is two to five percent per annum. We'll, we'll call it two and a half percent. So two and a half percent, I'm going to lose off my money every year through inflation. And it's mind boggling when you actually think about how we accept that. We just accept that every year our money is going to go down 2.5% in value. And we even accept that if we put it in a bank, and sometimes we don't even think about it, we put it in a bank at 1% and after a year it's gone through 2.5% of inflation, but 1.5% of, or 1%, because it's even less than that. But for argument's sake, we'll say it's gone through 2.5% of inflation and 1% of saving interest. So at the end of the year, even when we've been doing the right thing and we've been saving our money, our money has gone down in value by 1.5%. Now this is before we even talk about uh, bail-in laws or banks freezing your account or banks taking fees from your account or banks doing other things with your money such as fractional reserve lending, which further dilutes your money because it's pouring more money into the economy and therefore diluting your savings. So to answer your question, PK, the reason why it's been slow to be taken up in Australia and the world is primarily it's a new technology. Secondarily, it's taking on banks and banks have more money than God. And thirdly, because we're kind of privileged in the sense that we don't deal with hyperinflation like Venezuela and Zimbabwe and other countries, there's not a mad scramble to get these currencies. So at the moment there's this <clears throat> perfect storm of we're living in la-la land thinking that our money is fine and the biggest enemy of the bank, uh, biggest enemy of Bitcoin is the banks. So you think of every single technology that you've seen in your lifetime and then go further, project further into your grandparents' lifetime, you've seen pretty much every single technology progress. Whether it be transport from the horse and cart to an aeroplane, whether it be mail from the horse and cart to email, whether it be medicine from what we've dealt with in the past to what the, we have at the moment, whether it be even simple things like construction and food and farming, everything has progressed except for money money has remained stagnant in the way it operates and that's because these centralized bodies make a lot of money from managing money and creating money. Remember money is generally created from federal reserves which are neither a federal entity nor have any reserves of any value. They just create money out of thin air. So when a new technology comes along and says hey we're not going to use that any money it scares the crap out of them and then because they have so much money to take it on they can put a lot of scare campaigns and tactics out there and lobby governments to make sure that or attempt to make sure that this doesn't work. But this goes back to privacy coins and the internet. Can the internet be stopped? Well you can block sites and you can put firewalls up but can it be stopped? Absolutely not. Can even and then you go a step further can the dark web be stopped? The dark web is where a lot of bad things do happen and that can't be stopped. Now I'm not drawing an analogy between Bitcoin and the dark web, but I am draw drawing an analogy between the blockchain and the internet. It cannot be stopped. I I've given this example before, when I was in China, uh, Facebook was banned and is banned, but when I was in China, all the young people just openly had, a, had VPN and they all had Facebook and they're all using Google Chrome but they were just doing it through VPNs and that's in a communist nation that apparently has all this power. So can these technologies be stopped? No. Will they be stopped? Well, there may be attempts to stop, stop certain types of it like Monero and Zcash as an example. But the take up of crypto in Australia is slow because of our privilege essentially. We don't see a mad rush to need this money at the moment as we do see in somewhere like Venezuela, there was a big move for Dash to be taken up in Venezuela, which is just another type of cryptocurrency. And the reason why that was being uh, rushed to be taken up by the people is because they were sick to 
death of being able to buy a loaf of bread with the money that they had in the morning, but not being able to buy it in the afternoon. And they couldn't do that because of hyperinflation. And then you have countries like Zimbabwe that had $100 trillion bills because governments were just adding zeros and zeros and putting more and more money into the economy that these, they had to have more zeros on the notes. So a way to deal with it is that the government at one stage in Zimbabwe said, oh, we're going to cut off the last three to six zeros from the notes. And we're all just going to pretend that we're going to crack on like nothing's really happened. But it doesn't work. Fiat currencies don't work. And federal non-elected, or sorry, centralised non-elected so-called federal reserves that can completely destroy economies through fractional reserve lending and the corruption of money will eventually lead to even our privileged backsides moving into the crypto space. And we already see this. We already see this through quantitative easing, destroying the value of our money. We already see it through bail-in laws, giving banks the right to steal our money. And now we see the next attack on money through the cash ban, where they're forcing you to put your money into a bank. Because if you've got no cash, you have to put it in a bank. And if a bank can take a cut from everything that you do, say every time this tap and pay that we've been talking about, if they then change the parameters, so instead of you paying 1% or 5%, and they say, oh, we're just going to charge 10% for every transaction that you do, and you have no say in that and no alternative, you can't any longer say, well, I'm not going to use my credit card, I'm now going to use cash. Well, if there's no cash, you've got no choice. And if they've banned Bitcoin or attempted to ban Bitcoin, again, you've got no choice. So this mon monopoly on money, and you might even call it an ogolopoly because all the banks are working together, but essentially it's a monopoly on your money, is saying that, no, you have to use our money this way, and we can ban it, block it, and charge it any way we want at any time. So there's essentially a financial revolution happening in the world. People are becoming smarter with money, and they're becoming smarter with money, not just through saving and not wasting it through credit cards, but they're actually understanding what money is. Money is a language. Money is a language that says, I agree that this, this unit, it doesn't matter what you call it. You can call it a dollar, a rupee, a pound, a Bitcoin, a lula ling. I just made up that word. It doesn't matter what it is. If we agree it has a value and we agree to trade a good and service for that value, then it's money. Seashells, beads, feathers, gold, silver, Bitcoin, anything. It is all money, and ultimately, it can all be used in trade. And if we agree that it's money, then it's money. And if we want to use it for a good and service, and we agree that we speak the same language, then we'll use that money. So let's move this on to, uh, in Australia, why would we not use fiat currency anymore? Why would we not use the Australian dollar? Well, right now, primarily because of remittances. So. We are a multicultural nation in Australia, and many times, many people send money to their family overseas. And to do this at the moment, they have to do it through the SWIFT network. And the SWIFT network is essentially a, essentially a centralized way of sending money around the world. And the fees on sending that money around the world are absolutely absurd. And the time it takes to send this money around the world is completely unacceptable and completely unreasonable particularly now as we have a technology where we can, for all intents and purposes, email money to each other. So I can email you a photo, I can email you a video, I can email you a file. Why can't I email you money? The answer is banks. But then I can email you money if we use the blockchain. Through crypto, I can email you money immediately and you can have it. For example, the intro video to my channel was done by a gentleman in Romania. And it's a part of the global village. And he works, he does incredible work. And I just said to him, I said, how do you want to be paid? And I offered him, I said, do you want PayPal? Do you want US dollars? Do you want Australian dollars? Do you want Swift? Do you want Bitcoin? Do you want Ethereum? What do you want? And the first time I did work with him, he goes, I want Ethereum. And I said, cool. And within minutes, seconds, I sent him Ethereum and bang, the money was in there. However, had I gone through the Swift network, it would have taken a hundred times as long, maybe a thousand times as long, because it only takes seconds to go through a crypto transaction, whereas it takes days to go through a Swift transaction. So here I am in the first world operating with someone in the developing world, and I can do the transaction immediately for a fee of virtually nothing. 
So that is why in Australia we would use that. Now, if it was if it was my family member, and I'm working in Australia and I want to send money overseas, now instead of waiting um, to get time off work because if I want to go to a bank or Western Union or some type of business where I'm going to send money overseas, I have to do it essentially nine to five, five days a week, and then I have to wait up to five days, sometimes two weeks, for that money to go there, and I have to pay a huge fee. Well, with crypto, I can just do it. I could do it right now whilst I'm making this video. I could text it to someone overseas and it gets to them almost immediately, almost for free. Which goes to your last question about where, where can we find uh, who uses crypto in Australia? Well, there, there are, there's a big list and you can go to, essentially straight to Google, but to answer your question specifically, if you go to finder.com.au, there is a list of all the people who accept cryptocurrencies in Australia. And that list is growing, and that list is growing because if you're a, a provider of a good and service, and someone comes to you and says, hey, do you want this fiat money that is subjected to bail-in laws, quantitative easing, inflation, and the corruption of the banks, and all the time around that it takes to deal with this money, or I'll give you this, con this cu um, currency that works with deflation, that is, it goes up in value, as instead of going down in value, well, which one would you take? particularly as more and more people will accept Bitcoin now. So if you're trying to survive and you're like, well, I need to buy bread, you need the fiat currency. But the second that the shop who sells bread starts taking Bitcoin and other currencies like cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, and you are given an option in your life, do you want to take this fiat currency that goes down in value because of inflation? Or do you want to take this other currency that has a finite supply and is going up in value due to deflation, well, which one would you take? Initially, you'll probably hedge your bets. Initially, you'll probably say, well, I need, if you get paid 200 bucks a week, low numbers, but if you get 200 bucks a week and you need $100 to survive, and you put $100 in savings, you may take the risk and have the foresight to say, well, you know what, give me the $100 a week so I can buy the bread for now, but give me that other $100 in cryptocurrency, because it's gonna go up and be more safer than fiat currencies locked in a bank. So I hope that helps for now. I'm sorry I'm speaking really quick, but it's a really good question, and that's why I wanted to make an entire video about it. Again, to close off, the privacy coins that you may want to look at are Monero, Zcash, and a few others, but keep in mind that if there was an attack on currencies, cryptocurrencies, it would be those privacy coins, but on the other hand, you can't really attack them because just as you can't stop the internet, you can't stop the blockchain. Australia is slow to take up cryptocurrency seemingly because it's a new technology, they're enemy of the banks, this money model has never changed before. We feel that we are privileged, well we are privileged and feel that we don't need to ha have this new money because the money that we've got seemingly works at the moment. You'll find over the next few years it doesn't work, particularly when these banks start to collapse and they start stealing your money through bail-in laws and new laws are put in to stop you spending your money through cash pads, etc. And finally, if you want to see where cryptocurrency is accepted, go to findout.com.au. Hope that helps for now. Thanks for listening. Happy investing. And I'll talk to you next time.